Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering peritonitis. Now, peritonitis, that's infection of the peritoneal cavity. That is a medical emergency, so we're going to get into that. But before I get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support my channel. If you appreciate these videos that I'm bringing to you, please help me to grow. Please support this channel by liking this video. Please leave a comment if you can. Let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover in the future. Um, if you can post it on your social media platform or share, share it with a friend or a coworker or a classmate or a teacher, that will also help to support my channel. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost daily, you can watch me cover an array of different types of questions on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So guys, let's get started peritonitis. Look what I wrote next to peritonitis. Emergency. The minute that you get a test question, and it might not say peritonitis, but it gives you a situation where you should suspect peritonitis, that patient is a priority. All right, so let's get into it. Look what it says. Peritonitis results from a localized or generalized inflammatory process of the peritoneum. Primary peritonitis occurs when blood-borne or blood organisms enter the peritoneal cavity. Guys, that peritoneal, peritoneal cavity is supposed to be a sterile environment. Organisms can enter the peritoneum during peritoneal dialysis. That's one way, and we're going to go over the different ways. And the reason it's important for you guys to know the different ways that this can happen, when you get a test question, they're going to set it up, giving you a situation where patient has is getting peritoneal dialysis or um, patient had appendicitis, or they'll give you another situation where um, it's a very high risk factor for the patient to have peritonitis. That is going to be one of your clues. So it's going to be very important for you guys to know who's at risk for this happening. Let's keep going. Secondary peritonitis is much more common. It occurs when abdominal organs perforate. That means to burst through. That means to rupture, perforate or rupture and release their content. What is the content? Bile, enzymes, bacteria into the peritoneal cavity. Again, the peritoneal cavity is supposed to be a sterile environment, guys. Intestinal contents and bacteria. Let's stop right there. When they say intestinal contents, what are they talking about? Fecal matter, feces, intestinal content and bacteria irritate the normally what? Sterile peritoneum and produce an initial chem chemical peritonitis. Let's keep going. Abdominal pain is the most common symptom of peritonitis. A universal sign. That means no matter where you are, you could be in the US, you could be in Africa, you can be in Australia. That patient is going to exhibit the same sign when it comes to peritonitis. Look at this. A universal sign is tenderness over the involved area. That patient's not going to want you to touch them there. It hurts. Rebound tenderness. So if you were to palpate, as soon as you move your hand, it hurts even more. Rebound tenderness. Muscular rigidity and spasms are other signs of peritoneal irritation. Abdominal distension. Why do you think that patient has abdominal distension? Let me tell you something. Whenever, wherever you have an infection, something's wrong with your body, your body's going to try to protect itself. So when that patient has the peritonitis, when the patient has that feces, the acid contents, the enzymes, the bile, the bacteria, whatever is there that's not supposed to be there, the brain says body and body says yes. And brain says body needs help. And body says, I got you. And so what happens is the um, lots of uh, blood is going to flow to that area because what's in the blood? WBCs, those fighters, right? Fluid and electrolytes. Everything's going to rush there trying to help that area. And so that patient is going to have, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Abdominal distension. Plus, on top of that, all of that bacteria, cripe, enzymes, whatever is there is also going to cause that distension. So they're going to have uh, distension, fever because of the infection, tachycardia. Why are they having tachycardia? Think about it. There is an infectious process going on that can very well kill that patient. 
Heart says brain. Brain says yes. Nope. Let me back up. Brain says heart. And heart says yes. And brain says we're in trouble. So you need to speed up your rate to get more blood to that area. Why? Because the blood is carrying the oxygen, the vitamins, the nutrients, the fluid and electrolytes that that area needs. So yes, that heart is going to speed up because it's trying to rescue that peritoneal area. So it's trying to bring all of the vitamins, oxygen, everything to that area. So yes, that patient is going to have tachycardia. That's why. Let's keep going. Um, nausea, vomiting, and altered bowel habits may be present. Complications of peritonitis, and you need to know that, include hypovolemic shock. Well, Professor D, you just said they got abdominal distension because all this fluid is going to that area trying to save them. So what's going on? How can they have hypovolemic shock? hypovolemic shock. We're talking about uh, fluid where? In the vascular space, right? All of the fluid that was in the vascular space has left and gone to the peritoneal area to help. So guess what? Yes, that patient may very well have hypovolemic shock because guess what? If there's no fluid, there's no blood, there's no electrolytes, there's no vitamins, there's no nutrients within that vascular space, how are all the other organs going to be perfused? Those other organs, such as the pancreas, the liver, the spleen, the kidney, even your eyeballs, how are they going to be perfused? Because all of the fluid and blood and oxygen that was in the vascular space that used to perfuse those organs have detoured to where the problem is, that peritoneal area. So the patient very well is at risk for hypovolemic shock and those organs can start shutting down because they're not being perfused. Let's keep going. Sepsis, that's an infection in the bloodstream. And th that infection gets in the bloodstream. It's going to travel area everywhere and affect the whole body. Intra-abdominal abscess, of course, because all that feces and bacteria and all those microorganisms that are there. Paralytic ileus. Think about where this infectious process is happening. Do you think the GI tract is going to be moving the way it's supposed to and that patient's going to be having peristalsis the way it's supposed to? Absolutely not. Of course, that patient's going to have paralytic ileus. And with that paralytic ileus can come what? Obstruction, right? And acute respiratory distress syndrome. Peritonitis can be fatal, as in deadly, if treatment is delayed. Diagnostic tests, they can do a CBC to look to see what the WBCs look like. Peritoneal aspiration can be performed where they analyze this fluid in the peritoneal space to confirm, yes, this patient has a peritonitis because when they aspirate the fluid, remember that peritoneal space is supposed to be what? Sterile. So obviously if they see bacteria, feces and everything else that's going on, they know, okay, it's peritonitis. They can do um, abdominal x-ray to show dilated loops in the bowel, paralytic ileus. They can do ultrasound, CT scan. They can do a peritonoscopy. Let's keep going down. Treatment consists of antibiotics to kill all that bacteria. NG suction. Analgesics, remember, it's very painful. And IV fluid administration. Because remember, we need fluid where? Within the vascular space. We're trying to prevent hypovolemic shock. They'll drain the purulent uh, fluid and obviously repair any damage, any organs that have been perforated, such as the appendix. Nursing implementation, establishing IV access because that patient's going to need fluids. You're going to monitor the patient for pain, give them analgesics as ordered. Um, you can position the patient with the knees flex. The knees flex is going to increase comfort to that area, give them sedatives as ordered to relieve their anxiety. And another way you can relieve their anxiety, guys, is let them know what's going on and let them know what you guys are doing to help them. And the reason I say that when patients are informed, that automatically brings down their anxiety and fear because you know what? The more you teach them and let them know what you're doing, they trust in your skills. They trust in the facility and it relieves their anxiety. 
You're going to do INOs. You want to make sure that that kidney has not shut down, right? Because that's a big thing that can happen if the patient's in hypovolemic shock. You're going to be doing the INOs and you're going to be looking at those labs. You're going to be looking at the BUN, the creatinine, that GFR. You're going to check their vital signs, give them anti uh, anti-emetics as ordered, if they have that, uh, they're vomiting, they're nauseous, you're going to place that patient on NPO status. And let me tell you something, while they are NPO status, they're going to have what? NG tube suction. We have to rest the bowels. We have to rest that GI tract. So they're going to be on NPO and we don't want them to develop what? Ulcers. We're going to put them on low flow oxygen. Now, one more thing I want to bring to your attention, guys, take a look. Well, two more things I lied. Take a look at this table. The causes of peritonitis. Why is this important for you to know? Because when you get a test question, they are going to set it up and give you a situation with one of these that's going on. And then they'll give you some signs and symptoms of peritonitis. So you have to be able to recognize it. Number one, appendicitis with rupture. Remember that appendix, what's in that appendix? Fecal matter. So if it ruptures, we now have fecal matter in what should have been a sterile environment. Okay. So that's the number one um, symptom that they usually give you for test questions. But what else? Blunt or penetrating trauma. Someone stabs you in that area with a knife. That knife is full of bacteria. Diverticulitis with rupture. What do you think's in the dive in those little um diverticular sacs, fecal matter, perforated intestine. What do you think's in the intestines? Fecal matter, perforated peptic ulcer, peptic ulcer. Those are ulcers in the stomach. What do you think's in there besides those enzymes? It's not supposed to be in the, um, in that sterile environment, um, food, acid, hydrochloric acid, which should not be in the high, in the peritoneal space. Obviously, peritoneal dialysis, I should have put a star next to this, because this is another situation that they give a lot for test questions when they're trying to lead you to peritonitis. Okay, so make sure you guys take a look at um, table 42-12, those causes of peritonitis. Now, let's look at the interprofessional care. I already went over the diagnostic studies, the CBC, the x-ray, CT scan, ultrasound, uh, management. Patient is going to be NPO. That patient's NPO, you also expect what? An NG tube. They're going to get IV re uh, fluid replacement, the NG to low intermittent suction. Why? We need to decompress that um, gastric area. So we're putting that NG tube for decompression. We need to make sure that patient doesn't get what? Ulcers. We're going to give that patient antibiotic therapy, analgesics, antiemetics as ordered. Post-op, after they've had surgery, again, NPO, NG tube to low intermittent suction. Patient will be in high Fowler's position. You could have that leg flex. IV fluids with electrolyte replacement. Why? Remember, they're NPO but they still, they still need those fluid and electrolytes. Parental nutrition as needed, blood transfusion as needed. So you're going to be looking at that CBC, specifically the H&H, &H, right? Because that H&H, &H, it gets too low, patient's going to need blood. Uh, drug therapy, again, after surgery, antibiotics, sedatives as needed, opioids for the pain, antiemetics, Okay. And that is your peritonitis in a nutshell. Guys, please let me know what you thought about this video in the comments. Please don't forget to like this video. Don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost every day, you guys can catch me covering different kinds of questions on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching this video. And you guys will catch me on the next video.